At, Thurs <clears throat> at Thursday's hearing of the House Select Committee on January 6th, Congressman Jamie Raskin played previously unseen footage of congressional leaders during the January 6th Capitol riot. In the footage, top congressional figures like Speaker Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Mitch McConnell are seen attempting to contact local authorities to try to contain the violence occurring around them. The shocking video is meant to bolster the committee's argument that former President Trump encouraged the violence on January 6th and endangered the lives of lawmakers. Raskin, a Maryland Democrat, is one of the ex-president's fiercest critics and has blamed him for the unprecedented attack on the nation's capital. Back, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The president was still exhorting his supporters at the Ellipse to go fight like hell at 1250, around the time that the first wave of rioters first breached barricades defending the Capitol. Secret Service documents we recently received give a timeline of precisely what the White House knew and when. At 1.19, the President's Emergency Operations Center sent an email to Secret Service, National Security, and Military Advisors to the President and Vice President, informing them that, quote, hundreds of Trump supporters stormed through metal barricades at the back of the Capitol building about 1 p.m. Wednesday, running past security guards and breaking fences. When the president returned to the White House around 1.20, he entered the Oval Office and was told right then about the onset of violence at the Capitol. From that point until approximately 4 p.m., over the next two hours and 40 minutes, the president stayed in the White House dining room, attached to the Oval Office, and watched this unprecedented assault take place at the Capitol. We have testimony from several members of the president's White House staff establishing that President Trump refused entreaties from his closest advisors and family members to tell his supporters to stand down and leave the Capitol. Here's the testimony of President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. I can't talk about conversations with the president, but I can generically say that I said, you know, people need to be told there needs to be a public announcement fast that they need to leave the Capitol. And Pat, could you let us know approximately when you said that? Approximately when? Almost immediately after I found out people were getting into the Capitol or approaching the Capitol in a way that was, was uh, violent. You on the staff did not want people to leave the Capitol. On the staff? I, in I, the White House. I, I, don't, I I can't think of anybody, you know, on that day who didn't want people to get out of the the Capitol once the, you know, particularly once the violence started. No, I mean, what about the president? Yeah. Well, she said the staff, so I answered. No, I said in the White House. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I thought you said who, who else on the staff. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I can't reveal communications, but obviously, I think you know. Mr. Cipollone's testimony is corroborated by multiple other White House staff members, including Cassidy Hutchinson. Here's Ms. Hutchinson describing what she heard from Mark Meadows. He uh, had said something to the effect of, you know, you heard him, Pat. He doesn't want to do anything more. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. A former White House employee with national security duties similarly recalled an exchange between Mr. Cipollone and Eric Hirschman about President Trump's inaction against the mob assault underway at the Capitol. Mr. Hirschman said something to Mr. Cipollone. He seemed to relay that, you know, the president didn't want anything done. 
Throughout this period, some of the president's most important political allies, family members, and senior staff all begged him to tell his supporters to disperse and go home. They included Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, and other allies at Fox News, his son, Donald Trump Jr., the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy, others in Congress and officials in the cabinet and the executive branch, all of them made appeals to Donald Trump, which he rejected and he ignored. The select committee interviewed several people who were in the dining room with Donald Trump that afternoon, and every single one of these witnesses told us that he was watching the violent battles rage on television. He did not call his Secretary of Defense or the National Guard, the Chief of the Capitol Police, or the Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department. And to your knowledge, was the president in that private dining room the whole time that the attack on the Capitol was going on? Or did he ever go, to, again, only to your knowledge, to the Oval Office, to the White House Situation Room, anywhere else? To the best of my recollection, he was always in the dining room. Okay. Yeah, did, what did they say, Mr. Meadows or the president? at all during that brief encounter that you were in the dining room? What do you recall? I think they were, I really was watching the TV. Do you know whether he was watching TV in the dining room when uh, you talked to him on January 6th? Um, it's my understanding he was watching television. When you were in the dining room in these discussions, was the, uh, was the, the violence at the Capitol visible on the screen on the, in the, on the television? Yes. As the president watched the bloody attack unfold on Fox News from his dining room, members of Congress and other government officials stepped into the gigantic leadership void created by the president's chilling and studied passivity that day. What you're about to see is previously unseen footage of congressional leaders, both Republicans and Democrats, as they were taken to a secure location during the riot. You'll see how everyone involved was working actively to stop the violence, to get federal law enforcement deployed to the scene to put down the violence and secure the Capitol complex. Not just Democrats like Speaker Nancy Pelosi and House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, but Republicans like Vice President Pence, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Majority Whip John Thune, and countless other appointees across the administration. All of them did what President Trump was not doing what he simply refused to do. Take a listen. Uh, we're, start, we're starting to get surrounded. They're taking the uh, north front scaffolding. Unless we get more munitions, we are not going to be able to hold. The door has been breached and people are gaining access into the Capitol. But you know what? We have got to get finished the proceedings or else it would have all become restricted. USA! USA! Senator Schumer is at a secure location and they're locked down in the Senate. There has to be some way we can maintain the sense that people have that there's uh, some security or some confidence that government can function and that we can elect the president of the United States. Did we go back into session? We did go back into session, but now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on tear gas masks to prepare for a breach. Well, I'm trying to get more information. They're putting on their tear gas masks. We need an area for the Thousand members, they're all walking over now through the tunnels. I'm going to call up the effing secretary of DOD. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? I have something to say, Mr. Secretary. Well, I'm going to call the, the mayor of Washington, D.C right now and see what uh, other outreach she has to other police departments as Senator uh, Leader Hoyer has mentioned. Hi, Governor. Uh, this is Nancy. Uh, Governor, I don't know if you have been approached about the 
uh, Virginia National Guard, Mr. Hoyer was connect, uh, speaking to uh, uh, Governor Hogan, uh, but I still think you probably need the okay of the, uh, the federal government in order to come into another jurisdiction. Thank you. Oh my gosh, they're just breaking windows, they're doing all, all kinds of, it's really that somebody, they said somebody was shot, it's just, it's just horrendous and all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Okay, thank you, Governor. I appreciate what you're doing. And if you don't mind, I'd like to stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Virginia Guard has been called in. You yeah, know, I'm just okay. talking to Governor Northam. Yeah. And what he said is they sent 200 uh, state police and a unit of the National Guard. They're breaking windows and going in, uh, uh, obviously, ransacking our offices and all the rest of that. That's nothing. The, uh, the concern we have about uh, personal harm, safety, personal safety, is it just transcends everything. But the fact is, on any given day, they're breaking the law in many different ways, and, and quite frankly, much of it at the instigation of the president of the United States. And now. Uh, if he could, could at least uh, somebody. Yeah, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, in your law enforcement responsibility. A public statement, they should all leave. USA! 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 This cannot be just we're waiting for so-and-so. We need them there now, whoever you got. You okay. have. You also have troops. This is Steny Hoyer. Troops. Okay. So we have a little bit of time Air, to make that decision. Andrews Air Force Base. All right. Other military bases. Thank you. We Thanks need Paul. active Bye. duty National Guard. How soon in the future can you have the place evacuated, pulled, you know, cleaned out? I don't want to speak for the leadership that's going to be responsible for executing. Well, just pretend, just pretend for a moment it was the Pentagon or the White House or some other entity that was under siege. And let me say, you can logistically get people there as you make the plan. We're trying to figure out how we can get this job done today. We talked to Mitch about it earlier. He, uh, he's not in the room right now, but he was with us earlier uh, and said, you know, we want to expedite this and hopefully they could confine it to just one complaint, Arizona, and then we could vote and, and that would be, you know, then just move forward with the rest of the state. The overriding wish is to do it at the Capitol. What we are being told very directly is it's going to take days for the Capitol to be okay again. We've gotten a very bad report about the condition of, of the um, house floor with defecation and all that kind of thing as well. I don't think that that's hard to clean up, but I do think it is uh, more from a security standpoint of making sure that everybody is out of the building and how long will that take. I just got off with the vice president. And I got off with the vice president-elect. So I'll tell okay. what but what we left the conversation with, because he said he had the impression from Mitch that Mitch wants to get everybody back to do it there. Yes. I said that what well, we're getting a counterpoint that is we could take time uh, to clean up the poo poo that they're making all over the literally and figuratively in the Capitol, and that uh, it may take days to get back. Good news. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Good news.
In this video, you just saw Senator Chuck Schumer urging Acting Attorney General Jeff Rosen to get President Trump to call off the rioters. Of course, Acting AG Rosen did take action to defend the government, as did many other officials, but congressional leadership recognized on a bipartisan basis that President Trump was the only person who could get the mob to end its violent siege of the Congress, leave the Capitol, and go home. Here's Senator McConnell speaking after January 6th about how President Trump abandoned his duties and failed to do his job. It was obvious that only President Trump could end this. He was the only one who could. Former aides publicly begged him to do so. Loyal allies frantically called the administration. The president did not act swiftly. He did not do his job. He didn't take steps so federal law could be faithfully executed and order restored. No. In the midst of this violent chaos, Kevin McCarthy implored Donald Trump to tell his supporters in the mob to leave the Capitol. And when that didn't work, McCarthy called Trump's adult children to try to get them to intercede with Trump to call off the insurrectionary violence. In our prior hearings, we showed you a description of what McCarthy told Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler about his conversation with Trump during the violence. Another witness, Mick Mulvaney, President Trump's former chief of staff, has also come forward and corroborated her shocking account. You know, I asked Kevin McCarthy, who's the Republican leader, about this, um, and he said he called Donald Trump, he finally got through to Donald Trump, and he said, you have got to get on TV, you've got to get on Twitter, you've got to call these people off. You know what the president said to him? This is as it's happening. He said, well, Kevin, these are my people. You know, these are, these are Antifa. And Kevin responded and said, no, they're your people. They literally just came through my office windows, and my staff are running for cover. I mean, they're running for their lives. You need to call them off. And the president's response to Kevin, to me, was chilling. He said, well, Kevin, I guess they're just more upset about the election uh, you know, theft than you are. And that's, you know, you've seen widespread reports of, of Kevin McCarthy and the president having a, basically a swearing conversation. That's when the swearing commenced, because the president was basically saying, no, nah, I... I'm okay with this. Um, I, had, I had a conversation at some point in the day or week after uh, the, uh, the riot with Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, it was very similar to what Jamie had, uh, the conversation she had re re retold about how he called and asked the president to get them to stop, and the president told him something along the lines of, Kevin, maybe these people are just more angry about this than you are, maybe you're more upset. I had the conversation similar to that with Kevin in the day to week after, after the riot. And we know how Kevin McCarthy described President Trump's conduct, both in public and in private. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. These facts require immediate action by President Trump. Accept his share of responsibility, quell the brewing unrest, and ensure President-elect Biden is able to successfully begin his term. But let me be very clear to all of you, and I've been very clear to the president. He bears responsibilities for his words and actions. No ifs, ands, or buts. I asked him personally today, does he hold responsibility for what happened? Does he feel bad about what happened? He told me he does have some responsibility for what happened. Um, and he needs to acknowledge that. 2.24 p.m., knowing the deadly riot was now bearing down on his own vice president, President Trump composed and sent a tweet attacking Vice President Pence, accusing him of cowardice for not unilaterally rejecting electoral college votes for Joe Biden and simply handing Trump the presidency. The impact of that tweet was foreseeable and predictable. It further inflamed the mob, which was chanting, hang Mike Pence, and provoked them to even greater violence. This deliberate decision to further enrage the mob against Vice President Pence cannot be justified by
by anything that President Trump might have thought about the election. The tweet came precisely at the time Pence's Secret Service detail was most seriously concerned for the Vice President's physical safety. We've obtained new documents from the Secret Service, real-time chats that underscore the threat they knew the Vice President would be facing because of the President's escalating incitement of the mob. After Trump's tweet, one agent in the Secret Service's Intelligence Division immediately warned, POTUS just tweeted about Pence, probably not going to be good for Pence. Another agent reported the dramatic impact of Trump's anti-Pence tweet on his followers. POTUS said he lacked courage, over 24,000 likes in under two minutes. Employees at Twitter were nervously monitoring the situation. They knew that certain Twitter users were rioting at the Capitol and tweeting about it at the same time. As the afternoon progressed, the company detected a surge in violent hashtags on the platform, including lines of lethal incitement like, execute Mike Pence. Listen to this former Twitter employee, Anika Navaroli, who first came to the committee anonymously, but has now bravely agreed to be named because she wants to speak out about the magnitude of the threats facing our people. And you were also seeing content on the platform at that time um, that was threatening towards the vice president. Hashtag, yes. execute my pants. They were literally calling for his execution. As this tweet was going out. Yes, and after, in response to this tweet too, because I think as, as many of as many of Donald Trump's tweets did, it again fanned the flames. And it was individuals who were already constructing gallows, who were already willing and able and wanting to execute someone and looking for someone to be killed. Now the individual who has called upon them to begin this coup is now pointing the finger at another individual um, while they're ready to do this. Here's a small sample of the reactions that President Trump's Fan the Flames tweet provoked among Capitol rioters in real time. What percentage of the crowd is going to the Capitol? 100 percent. It is it is spread like wildfire that Pence has betrayed us and everybody's marching on the Capitol, all million of us. It's insane. Between 2.30 and 2.35, within 10 minutes of President Trump's tweet, thousands of rioters overran the line that the Metropolitan Police Force's Civil Disturbance Unit was holding on the west side of the Capitol. This was the first time in the history of the Metropolitan Police Department that a security line like that had ever been broken. President Trump's conduct that day was so shameful and so outrageous that it prompted numerous members of the White House staff and other Trump appointees to resign. In prior hearings, you've heard Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger and Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews explain why they felt compelled to resign on that day. Since then, we've spoken to more high-ranking officials, like President Trump's envoy to Northern Ireland and former Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, who resigned after the 6th in protest of Trump's misconduct and to dissociate themselves from his role in the violence. Take a listen to what they had to say. I was stunned by violence and uh, was stunned by the president's apparent indifference to the violence. And now was the time for the presidential. I thought he failed at doing it. I thought he failed at a, at a critical time to be the sort of leader that the, the nation needed. I think the events at the Capitol, uh, however they occurred, were shocking. And it was something that, as I mentioned in my statement, that I could not put aside. And at a particular point, the events were such that it was impossible for me to continue, given my personal values and my philosophy. I came as an immigrant to this country. I believe in this country. 
I believe in a peaceful transfer of power. I believe in democracy. And so I was a, it was a, a decision that I made on my own. When security assistance began to arrive at the Capitol and the tide turned against the insurrection, President Trump finally gave his painfully belated instruction at 4.17 p.m. So after multiple hours of rioting and more than 100 serious injuries suffered by our law enforcement officers, the crowd finally began to disperse. Listen carefully to what they said as they decided to leave the Capitol. Finally, at 6.01, President Trump tweeted again, not to condemn the mass violence in any way, but rather to excuse and glorify it. Significantly, he made it clear that he considered the violence perfectly foreseeable and predictable. Check it out. These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously, viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly, unfairly treated for so long. These are the things that happen, he said, giving the whole game away. Trump was telling us that the vice president, the Congress, and all the injured and wounded cops, some of whom are with us today, got what was coming to us. According to Trump, January 6th should not be a day that lives in shame and infamy in our history, but rather in glory. Remember this day forever, he wrote proudly, as if he were talking about D-Day or the Battle of Yorktown. Trump did nothing to stop the deadly violence for obvious reasons. He thought it was all justified, he incited it, and he supported it. Would it have been possible at any moment for the president to walk down to the podium in the briefing and, and talk to the nation at any time between when you first gave him that advice at 2 o'clock and 4.17 when the video statement came Would that have been possible? Would it have been possible? Yes. Yes, would have been possible. The president had wanted to make a statement um, and address the American people. He could have been on camera almost instantly. And conversely, the White House press corps has offices that are located directly behind the briefing room. And so if he had wanted to make an address from the Oval Office, we could have assembled the White House press corps probably in a matter of minutes to get them into the Oval for him to do an on-camera address. Mr. Chairman, nothing in law or fact could justify the president's failure to act. And I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct. Mr. Chairman, in numerous places, our Constitution strongly opposes insurrection and rebellion. Article 1 gives Congress the power to call forth the militia to suppress insurrections. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualified from holding federal and state office anyone who has sworn an oath to defend the Constitution but betrays it by engaging in insurrection or rebellion. It was President Lincoln at the start of the Civil War in 1861 who best explained why democracy rejects insurrection. Insurrection, he said, is a war upon the first principle of popular government, the rights of the people. American democracy belongs to all the American people, not to a single man. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. During this committee's first hearing in July of last year, our witnesses were four 